All right, now we have reached the Bronze Age, roughly 1970, though some people say 1968, until the mid 80s. There, some people say 1984, some say 1985. Well, I mentioned that DC Comics kind of started taking a new direction in the Bronze Age. There had been introduction of a lot of new superheroes in the Silver Age. In fact, DC was responsible for ushering superheroes back as a, um, a popular thing. But a lot of it was very kind of simplistic. There was uh, the, the characters, especially in the early part of the Silver Age, but this was really true throughout for DC, were practically interchangeable. And there weren't a lot of, uh, of complex or mature storylines. And all of that starts changing with the advent of the Bronze Age. And if we take 1970 as the year that things shifted from silver to bronze, that works really well when discussing DC's change because these two guys took over the Batman comics in January of 1970. These two guys being Denny O'Neill. We've uh, talked about him before. He was the uh, journalist from St. Louis that was uh, friends with Roy Thomas that uh, came to Marvel the same time Roy Thomas did roughly as, uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a staff writer uh, and quickly left Marvel, went to Charlton, and then when Dick Giordano left Charlton to go to D.C., Denny O'Neill came with him. Neil Adams was uh, um, an artist originally from New York City uh, who uh, gotten started in the 1960s. Uh, really was relatively... Uh, uh, well, he had, he had worked first before he got into the comics in 1966-67 at DC, he had uh, he had worked on comic strips as uh, sometimes sort of like a backup artist, and he had uh, he had worked on uh, a comic strip uh, based on the TV show Ben Casey, Doctor Ben Casey, throughout the 60s, and he had also worked as a commercial artist in advertising, and as a result of that, perhaps his his style was less cartoony, I guess you could say, than a lot of the artists who were working at that time and was much more, I guess you could say, uh, photorealistic uh, in, in how he drew particularly human characters. And you'll see what I mean in a moment. So the two of them were... Uh, it became a team on the Batman books. And when that happened, they ushered in a new look from Neil Adams and a new approach from Denny O'Neill, which really was not that new. It was actually more of a return to the roots of Batman, who had been, in 1939 and 1940, a dark and a mysterious figure figure of the night and then he got Robin as a sidekick and that sort of lightened things up and then you know late 40s through the 50s it was all really kind of um, juvenile you know um, remember some of the covers that we looked at from that time period well here we're going to uh, um, we're, we're going to have a much more dark and brooding Batman much more a mysterious figure of the night once again. And uh, the, the new look uh, is, uh, well, he's still got the uh, basic, the, the gray tights and the, the blue uh, cowl and cape and so forth. He's a lot more, well, he's a lot thinner as drawn uh, by, by Neil Adams, more athletic looking and less stocky and blocky than previous artists. Uh, he's got the new um, yellow uh, background on his bat symbol, of course. But uh, the biggest difference is he's got 
that leaner look and his ears under Neil Adams, the ears on his mask get real long, like they had originally been. Now, we've talked already about Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams. We've mentioned them several times before now. Um, and, and they are really a famous, a famous creative team. However, on the Batman books, it's important that we don't forget Dick Giordano, who was the inker that uh, worked with Neil Adams on Batman and Detective Comics and would also uh, work with them on, uh, on Green Lantern. And so his contribution really helped to shape that new look that uh, Adams usually gets all the credit for. Adams should get most of the credit, but let's not forget the inker. And then here are uh, some other examples. You can see uh, there's Batman looking all dark and brooding. You've got the introduction of new villains like Ra's al Ghul and his daughter Tanya that would become major, major players in the Batman mythos. And we talked about this when we were discussing teenage sidekicks. They get rid of Robin in a painless way by sending him off to college. And then that sets... Uh, Bruce Wayne, alias Batman, up to be that mysterious lone figure. Now, in addition, the uh, the team of O'Neill, Adams, and Giordano brought uh, brought back some Golden Age uh, characters like Two Face. They brought back Two Face, who hadn't been used since the 1940s. They also returned the Joker to his roots. The Joker um, had started off in 1940 as a kind of a scary homicidal maniac that kills people just for the heck of it. And he had transitioned when, when Batman uh, comics had gotten, I guess, more juvenile in the 40s and, and through the 50s into this caricature, um, right? He's a, he's a guy in a clown uh, getup that just loves to pull pranks, silly pranks. Well, now, once again, his silly pranks are maniacal, psychotic, and dangerous. And his look uh, reverts back to, uh, to the look from the 1940s. Now, his outfit had never really changed. I mean, he'd had the green hair and the white skin, and he wore... Um, a purple zoot suit, which is what that was, as introduced in 1940, and uh, you know a green shirt, and that had been that had been the look throughout, even on the Batman TV show, but the Neil Adams Dick Gier Giordano uh, iteration of the Joker gets much more lanky and lean, skinny looking, like he had originally been. And, uh, well, in that, in that skinny frame, there's a whole lot of crazy. All right, well, that was January. They took over Batman. Um, O'Neill wanted to be able to deal with social issues in his writing. Now, there hadn't been a lot of dealing with social issues. There had been a few stabs at it in the 60s, but nothing major. He wanted to deal with the types of issues that were important to him. And he, he sort of was able to do that on the new, uh, on his version of Batman. But there were limits, right? Because Batman was one of the flagship characters of DC. So they didn't want to get too controversial. So uh, as he was pressing for the, uh, the ability to stretch his writing more... He was, he was offered, uh, offered this deal. You can take over Green Lantern, which was doing poorly sales-wise and was about to be canceled. So DC figured, editorial figured, there's nothing really to lose because this book's probably going to get canceled soon anyway. So they let O'Neill take over the writing. And Adams comes along. And like I said, Giordano uh, also... Uh, sometimes, although uh, a lot of times Adams inked his own pencils in this in this book, and they changed the title from Green Lantern 
to Green Lantern co-starring Green Arrow. So they bring the two green guys together and make them pals, although they don't always get along. As I, uh, as I mentioned when we talked about uh, uh, Green, green Lantern and, and Green Arrow earlier when we were discussing um, African-American representation, the, uh, this, this kind of, it was like a buddy movie. It was like a road picture, as they used to call them. But these two friends, who were friends, um, were political opposites. Green Arrow, alias Oliver Queen, was extremely liberal and extremely outspoken. Now remember, this is 1970, so this is right in the middle of all kinds of uh, social upheaval uh, and uh, movements, right? Um, the civil rights movement, uh, the black power movement is, un, is, is in full swing as this is going on, gay rights, women's liberation, all those things. So Oliver Queen is an outspoken liberal, and Green Lantern is, well, you could probably describe him more as kind of a moderate conservative you know, right of center, although not all the way to the, you know, to any kind of extreme. But he's kind of a, you know, law and order kind of guy. And <clears throat> they frequently are at uh, political and cultural odds. And uh, as they're brought together as, as uh, unofficial partners in this book, they go on a road trip to discover America because it's 1970, and that's just what you know. That's just what you do. And for a, a little while, uh, they had a traveling companion in one of the Guardians of Oa, the the skinny little blue aliens who are uh, in charge of the Green Lanterns. Uh, this guy was disguised as a as a human. Uh, he didn't he didn't last with them a long time. But their their journey to find America lasted throughout the couple of years that uh, O'Neill and Adams were in charge of the book. And it was during that time, as previously mentioned, that this famous scene uh, was depicted wherein uh, an, Afri an elderly African-American man kind of puts Green Lantern on the spot as to why he doesn't do more to advance racial justice and to look out for the interests of Black skins, as he calls them. And it was during this time period that John Stewart, the character John Stewart, was introduced, who was really DC's first black superhero, although he didn't have his own book, uh, as sort of uh, Green Lantern's substitute. You know, if, if uh, you know Green Lantern has to call in sick or whatever, uh, then John Stewart is the guy that's supposed to step up. Well, <clears throat> one of the things that Denny O'Neill wanted to write about, and this is, we're talking 1971 now, one of the things he wanted to write about was drugs, the, uh, the issue of, of drugs as a problem, drug addiction in the country, among America's youth in particular, and, you know, the, uh, the, the bosses at, uh, at DC Comics said, well, actually, no, because the Comics Code Authority, way back in the mid-50s, had established among all the many rules, you can't even mention drugs at all. Not even if you're you know, mentioning it uh, to uh, portray it in a bad light. So that's kind of an impasse for Denny O'Neill. Well, as it turns out, right around the same time, that editorial and Neil Adams were having these discussions about uh, portraying drug abuse as kind of a social statement and Neil Adams being told he can't do it. At that same time, the, uh, the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and remember this is the Nixon administration, that, uh, that government agency contacts Stan Lee and requests, because uh, there is a pandemic of drug abuse in the country, requests that Marvel address drug abuse in, uh, in their comics in some way 
as a, a public service. Well, Stan Lee decides to do that in the pages of their best-selling book, The Amazing Spider-Man. And uh, in issue 96, May 1971, the first of a three-part story, the, uh, the story opens up with Spider-Man rescuing this, uh, this high teenager who has been popping the pills and therefore thinks he can fly and is dancing on, uh, on a window ledge way high up in the air. Just kind of giddy and, and, and goofy, which is very reminiscent of uh, the 1930s movie Reefer Madness, if you're familiar with that. And so Spider-Man rescues the teenager and, and carries them down to the ground and uh, says, boy, you'll never catch me doing hard drugs. And uh, then afterwards discovers that his roommate, Harry Osborne, son of Norman Osborne, the Green Goblin, his roommate, Harry, is popping the pills too. And so he has to be taken to the hospital because he's accidentally taken, had an overdose. Well, um, this was done at the request of the United States government. But the Comics Code Authority didn't care. You can't mention drugs. It's right there in the rules. So no, you do not get the Comics Code Authority's seal of approval. And Stan Lee decided, and uh, Martin Goodman approved this. Now, Goodman had sold the company, but he's still the publisher. Not the owner, but the publisher. They decided to uh, put these three issues of Amazing Spider-Man out there without the Comics Code Authority's seal of approval. And so they are distributed to newsstands and spinner racks, and this storyline gets national attention. It's in all the newspapers. Marvel Comics is doing this incredibly brave thing by, uh, you know, going against the uh, CCA in order to provide a public service and you know, inform our, our nation's youth about the, uh, the ill effects and dangers of drugs. Well, that doesn't make the CCA look very good, right? That they were trying to uh, essentially stop this from, from happening, even though the government had requested it. So this leads to, in 1971, um, the representatives from all the publishers... Marvel, DC, and everybody else meeting with the Comics Code Authority to revise the rules and make it acceptable to mention these things if you are saying they're bad, like honestly saying they're bad. Now, back back in the 1940s, you know, they were sensationalizing stuff and using, oh, but by the way, don't do this, as, as a cover-all excuse to be able to show the most lurid of things. And that's why the Comics Code Authority was revised in 1971. And while they were at it, while they were at it, they loosened the restrictions on horror, which led to that uh, kind of renaissance of, of horror comics in the 70s. All, all interconnected. Meanwhile, over at DC, they can't tell Neil Adams he can't do this now, right? Because it has just already been done which led to a change in the rules. So, in the September 1971 issue of Green Lantern and Green Arrow, you got the first of a two-part story in which Green Arrow discovers that his former teenage sidekick, Speedy, is addicted to heroin. And uh, this is a very dramatic and and very well-written story. And it also demonstrates some, some differences, some generational differences, right? They tell Stan Lee, do something about drugs. And essentially, he does, he portrays drug use the way that, uh, you know, uh, scary public service announcements from 1930 would have done, right? You take, a, you take a pill or, you know, inject the marijuanas and you'll be jumping out windows, um, which is... To say the to say the least, a gross exaggeration. You 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 know, um, 
enough marijuana and you won't even have, you know, have the, uh, uh, the, the drive to open the window. But uh, over in over at D.C., the much younger Neil Adams has a much more realistic look at actually the use of heroin, which is uh, uh, still a big problem or has become a big problem again. And, uh, you know, it's not a matter of, of speedy Roy Harper um, thinking he can fly. It's, he, he, got, he's, he's, he got really depressed. And so then he wound up turning to heroin and was trapped. So anyway, both these storylines, in Amazing Spider-Man and in Green Lantern, Green Arrow, both around the summer of 1971, were extremely well-received and critically acclaimed. Oh, the Spider-Man story, I don't want to make it sound like it's not a good story. It was just not nearly as well done as the Green Lantern one. All right, well... By this point, um, O'Neill and Adams have been in charge for like a year and a half of the Batman titles, and they are regaining their popularity. Now, by 1968-69, Spider-Man had climbed up the charts and had actually passed up Batman in popularity. And if you'll recall, back in 66, Batman was selling like almost 900,000 copies because of the popularity of the TV show. Now it's down to like 300,000. Uh, and I think it was at number nine with Spider-Man at number seven. Uh, so Neil Adams has rejuvenated with his artwork and of course Denny O'Neill with his, with his stories. But Adams becomes a, uh, he becomes a celebrity, a superstar, as Jim Steranko had done right before this and Adams uses the leverage that he now has by being so incredibly in demand in several different ways. For one thing, he's doing freelance work. Now he's not on staff at DC, he's a freelancer. But generally speaking, there was this kind of unspoken understanding that if you are freelancing for Marvel, you're not allowed to also freelance for DC. And if you do, then you won't be offered any more work at Marvel and vice versa. If you're freelancing at DC, you're not allowed to work for the competition. It's not in your contract because you don't have you know a contract. You're doing work for hire month by month. But it's just understood. And if an artist did that and... Uh, one of the employers found out about it, they wouldn't get any more work. So on the rare occasions, someone took the risk, they would use a fake name. Neil Adams, who's been at DC for two or three years and is now extremely, extremely popular, also starts doing work for Marvel at the same time. Working for Marvel and DC both at once. So... Um, actually, he had already started. He he'd, So he's doing stuff at DC. He winds up on Batman. He'd been doing X-Men, Uncanny X-Men, like in 1968, 69. Uh, now he's working for DC. He takes on the Avengers and increases the sales of the Avengers because of the popularity of his art. So the thing is, because he's become like one of the first comic book art celebrities, neither Marvel or DC is going to fire him because he's making the money, even if he's also making the competition money at the same time. So that's a use of his clout. And in the early 70s, he started to, get, uh, to become actively involved in labor rights issues in comic books for comic book freelancers, writers and artists. And in fact, he tried to, uh, tried to organize a union. And remember, Carmine Infantino, who was in charge at DC, found out about that. And that's when, you know, that's, he went, that's when he went to the Philippines and got as many uh, new artists from the Philippines who were willing to work uh, more cheaply 
uh, as he could. Now, those artists were great artists. They were excellent artists. Um, he also starts publicly, publicly coming out in defense of other artists and other writers. Uh, he becomes a big public spokesman for the rights of Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster who still were trying to get some kind of remuneration, some kind of fair remuneration for creating Superman. And uh, he takes on their cause and brings attention to it because he's getting interviewed in you know major newspapers and magazines. And he also takes on the cause of Jack Kirby and his efforts to, uh, to get to get proper credit and his efforts to get his original artwork back. And eventually, eventually Adams forms the Comics Creators Guild in 1978. Uh, so that's not exactly a union, but almost. And uh, a lot of changes, a lot of changes were, were wrought in the comic book business in the late 70s and 1980s as a result of Neil Adams being a bold and tireless voice for creators' rights. So um, definitely, if you're thinking about, uh, you know, uh, Neil Adams, I don't know if, if this should come up on a test or something, uh, you got to remember he was one of the first arts artist celebrities that his work on Batman and Green Lantern in the early 70s was revolutionary, and he was... Uh, a major force in getting more rights for comic book writers and artists. It was Neil Adams who provided the artwork for a really famous storyline in the pages of The Avengers, which was being written at that time and had been for, for a while by Roy Thomas. Uh, it's known as the Cree Skrull War, and you'll occasionally see references uh, to this in the comics or in you know histories of comics. It was uh, it was a multi-part story that was cosmic in scale, that uh, introduced elements that would affect you know the other Marvel books because it's sort of like uh, has this. Uh, well, these two alien races, both of which had been introduced in the pages of Fantastic Four, but which have uh, become involved uh, with several different Marvel superheroes titles. So these two races go to war, and Earth gets caught in the middle, and therefore the Avengers and Captain Marvel have to uh, step in and, and get involved. Um, if, if you haven't read a lot of comic books, but you have watched the Marvel movies, then the Captain Marvel movie uh, can show you some some elements of this, these two races fighting one another. All right, well, um, Adams uh, and O'Neill, that's one major aspect of the beginning of the, the, the Bronze Age. Another is the move of Jack Kirby from Marvel to DC. And remember, you know, uh, DC basically agreed to give him full reign and let him do what he wants. And one of the things he wanted to do was that uh, that crime comic, that one-shot crime comic that they put out as a magazine. But mostly what he wanted to do was to take his creative energies and the sorts of things that he had done at Marvel, like, for example, the creation of the, crawl, uh, the Skrulls and the Kree, and... You know the uh, the Inhumans and uh, and so forth uh, issues of the Fantastic Four and Thor with all the stuff about Asgard. Big, huge sci-fi fantasy type things, in other words, to to introduce that into DC with a whole new kind of sub universe that he created, uh, and uh, uh, comics like the New Gods. That's what introduced this with the hero, Orion. Um, the character, Mr. Marvel, which was closely... Actually, all these are connected together. And the Forever People. 
as well as uh, some of the things we talked about before, like uh, uh, Commandy and, and OMAC that were uh, dystopian, futuristic things. So he, he brings all these, these in, and uh, this includes the introduction of a major villain to the DC universe, the, the, the main bad guy in the fourth world comics, Darkseid. Uh, that's where and how he was, uh, he was introduced, created by Jack Kirby. Well, meanwhile, back over at Marvel, Stan Lee is feeling, feeling kind of down. Um, he's kind of down because uh, Jack Kirby just kind of like uh, packed up and left in the middle of the night, it seemed like. And now he's taken his creative energies that had really been a major, major component in the success of Marvel over to Marvel's rivals, just as Marvel was starting to catch up with them, right? So that made uh, Stan Lee fearful about the future. He was, he was down because they'd had to cancel the Silver Surfer because readers just hadn't found it. The readers who did, mostly college-age uh, readers, really, really were loyal to it. But it didn't really catch on with uh, the younger set because it was maybe a little too philosophical. That's what he had done with, uh, with this character. And the character, remember, had been mostly Jack Kirby's creation. But Stan Lee had used uh, the Silver Surfer as a way to uh, articulate his philosophies. And it just didn't catch on. So he's sad about that. He takes, he takes a break. He takes a sabbatical and works on trying to write a play. Now, I remember, as a young man, his, his dream had been to be a famous novelist, and he'd always been kind of embarrassed that he was working in comic books. Eventually, uh, he gets to the point that he's actually thinking about following Jack Kirby over to D.C. And word of that gets out to the new corporate owners of Marvel. Remember, they've been bought by this company that, that is really, really focused on uh, the licensed characters and the bottom line. They don't want Stan Lee to take his creative energy to the rivals, and they also don't want the bad publicity because they know that Stan Lee's kind of promotional talents are also a big reason that uh, Marvel had become so successful. So, they get him to stay uh, by giving him a promotion, a really big promotion. He, um, in uh, 1972, becomes president and publisher of Marvel Comics. But wait you might say, and Martin Goodman definitely said, Martin Goodman is the president and publisher of Marvel Comics. Well, not anymore. Um, he had been for almost 30 years, but remember, he sold the company. He doesn't own the company anymore. He was allowed to keep his position, but they'd much rather lose him than Stan Lee, so he's out. He is forced out. Uh, so Lee becomes president and publisher, which means he is no longer... Uh, directly involved in the editing, uh, the day-to-day -day chores of getting all the books, getting all the books out. Uh, that, uh, that position is assumed by Roy Thomas instead, 1972. Um, this is the point at which the, uh, the company that bought Marvel gets bought by another company, Cadence. Uh, Stanley discovered he didn't really like being president either, although he didn't mind being publisher, because being publisher means basically not, not running the business. It means being involved and being the final word in getting the books out. So uh, they bring Jim Galton in as president. Um, didn't really have any comics background, I don't think, but he served as president for a long time. Um, over a quarter of a century, and Stan remains as as the publisher, and then then he he moves out uh, to to California, as I've mentioned before, 
to be in charge. He's still the publisher of the comics part, but now his, his offices are located in Hollywood as he's working on trying to get the Marvel properties licensed and on television. And over the course of the 1970s, uh, in addition to the uh, animated series, including a, a new version of the Fantastic Four cartoon that comes out in the late 70s, there are live-action TV versions of Spider-Man and the Incredible Hulk. Uh, Spider-Man didn't do so well because they weren't really able to do much with special effects. Uh, but for the Hulk, the only special effects they needed was a big guy to paint green. Uh, and so they were able to pull that off. And it was very, very popular and successful and ran for many years. And eventually, eventually in uh, 1977, Marvel gets the licensing for uh, Star Wars, this, this new idea. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. But this is a major thing. I mean, no one knew Star Wars was going to be successful. It didn't seem like something that would be. And George Lucas had actually been shopping it around. He had shopped it around to toy companies, and all the major toy companies were like, eh, no, thank you. This We don't even know what this is. And he was shopping it around to comic book companies who responded the same way. But Marvel took a gamble. Uh, and this made that Hollywood connection stronger than ever. All right, some other characters and storylines from the Bronze Age, specifically from the 1970s, that uh, that we should take a look at because they were uh, they were significant and they get uh, mentioned from time to time. Still, you had the Kree Skrull War, 1973. You had the Avengers Defenders War. Now this this is important because it was the first multi-part crossover in a, in a comic book company. Not a crossover between companies, but crossover between titles. Uh, in this case, both titles were being written by Steve Englehart and drawn by Sal Buscema, John Buscema's younger brother. The Defenders, um, they hadn't been out that long. They were, uh, they were called a non-team. Essentially, the Defenders were whoever Doctor Strange could get together on any given occasion. They didn't have, like, an official membership roster, and they didn't have a chairperson, and they didn't have a secret hideout. So, essentially, Doctor Strange, there's a problem. He's got certain people that he goes to, right? Uh, the Hulk and the Submariner uh, and the Silver Surfer uh, were the first iteration of the Defenders. And later on, there's other characters that are going to be a part of it, like Hellcat and the Valkyrie, Luke Cage for a while, and so forth. But there is a misunderstanding, as tends to happen, right, in comic books when you want the good guys to fight each other. They usually uh, don't stop and think things through. And so there's this, they're being manipulated, and they have to get these various items, kind of like on a quest, and have to fight each other over them. And uh, it... It wasn't the best storyline, really, but it brought exposure to the Defenders because the Avengers was one of Marvel's top-selling books. And, like I said, it was the first time you had a storyline that wasn't confined to one comic book, one title. It was kind of batted back and forth between two titles. In 1973, also in the pages of Amazing Spider-Man, which Stan Lee had, uh, had left Spider-Man by this point. Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four were the last, last books that Stan Lee continued to write. And by 73, when he got that uh, um, promotion and eventually moved out to, to California, uh, he relinquished those. I think Roy Thomas took over Fantastic Four. Um, Jerry Conway was the writer on Amazing Spider-Man at this time. And Ross Andrew uh, was the uh, penciler. Uh, there was a storyline in which Peter Parker's girlfriend, Gwen Stacy, gets killed very dramatically. Um, 
the Green Goblin kidnapped her, and he throws her off the Brooklyn Bridge. And uh, actually, I think it was the George Washington Bridge. But anyway, Spider-Man uh, grabs her with his webbing, uh, not uh, not taking his physics training into account and thinking about what the sudden stop will do when he jerks her with his webbing and it actually breaks breaks her neck and he actually, actually had accidentally killed her. Uh, there's some more stuff to feel guilty about. Well, this was a huge, huge story and everyone was talking about it. This issue of Spider-Man was... Uh, it was going. It immediately just went through the roof in its resale value, and it was kind of it was kind of rare for a major supporting character to be killed off, but not unheard of. In fact, uh, Gwen Stacy's dad, who was a police captain, had been killed off in the pages of Spider Man. But the way that it was done, with such high drama. And uh, the second half of the two-part storyline, Spider-Man uh, goes after the Green Goblin, and the Green Goblin winds up accidentally getting killed in that one. So, uh, the night Gwen Stacy died. Another different thing about this one, it didn't tell you the title of the story until the very last page, the very last panel, because they didn't want to give it away, right? Well, um, about a... A year after that, in the pages of Amazing Spider-Man, uh, once again, same creative team, Jerry Conway and Ross Andrew, and I think Mike Esposito doing the inks, a new character is introduced called the Punisher. And uh, he's not introduced as a superhero. He's actually the villain of the piece. Um, he, he eventually goes from... from misunderstood villain to anti-hero. So if you're not familiar with the Punisher, Frank Castle, um, recently returned from Vietnam, a uh, Marine captain. His family is killed by gangsters, and so he decides to continue to fight as a soldier, but uh, makes his war against crime, uh, except he doesn't catch people and, and put them in jail. He's... Uh, uh, he's pretty pretty rough in his vigilante justice, which brings him into conflict frequently with Spider-Man and later other heroes. So that's when he showed up. Also an amazing Spider-Man. The year after that, there's a, a storyline that is uh, more infamous than famous. The Clone Saga. So Gwen Stacy, who's dead, shows back up. Turns out she's been cloned by Professor Miles Warren, who was the chemistry professor of Peter Parker and Gwen Stacy, who has this really unhealthy obsession with her, and so had cloned her. Turns out he cloned Spider-Man. Turns out he's cloning everybody. Uh, and then uh, this goes on for like a year, this storyline. And uh, eventually you've got uh, Spider-Man fighting the Spider-Man clone, and neither one of them knows which one is real. Uh, and the, the story finally gets gets resolved. But it it was regarded as like one of the worst comic book storylines, uh, multi-part storylines to have shown up uh, in Marvel comics, especially up to that time. And it was often referred to in sort of a cautionary way, like be careful, don't get carried away, don't get too uh, unbelievable in your storytelling or you'll have a disaster like the Clone Saga. Except, I guess, you know, 20 years or so was enough for some people to forget that. So they had another Clone Saga in the 90s that was just as bad. All right, well, another significant thing, and in many ways perhaps the most significant thing to happen in the 1970s at Marvel was... A redesign of the X-Men. Now, we talked about the, the creation of, of the X-Men uh, by uh, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. And there were those five original members. Uh, Cyclops, Marvel Girl, Iceman the Angel and the Beast. And there were three or four other characters introduced throughout the 60s that would be like occasional part-time members. But overall, after... After the, 
relative success of the X-Men under Roy Thomas and Neil Adams in the late 60s when it rose all the way up to number 26 or 27. Um, sales went way down and they were so low that it was in danger of cancellation and in fact they they made it bi-monthly and stopped even making new stories they just started reprinting the old stories until in 1975 writer Chris Claremont was given the go-ahead to try something different and with artist Dave Cockrum uh, they designed a whole new team of mutants uh, so uh, uh, they are recruited by Professor X to save the original team who've been captured by the bad guys. And so you've got a more international uh, team. You've got Storm, who is from Kenya. You've got Wolverine, who had already been, he's the only one of these that had already been introduced in the pages of Incredible Hulk. He's from Canada. You've got Colossus from the Soviet Union. You've got Nightcrawler from Austria. And... You have the Native American character, Thunderbird. And they're introduced in Giant Size X-Men, number one, 1975. And it does pretty well. It does pretty well. Uh, Well enough that uh, they they have them become the the new team. Cyclops and Marvel Girl stay on uh, with all these new characters. And then gradually, gradually, over the next five years... The X-Men inch up in popularity until, as we will discuss later on, about 1979, it really starts to take off. And then in 1980, with the Dark Phoenix saga, it just explodes and all of a sudden becomes Marvel's most popular property. All right, well, in 1975, let's take a look at... uh, where Marvel is so far as uh, their creative team. They've been working on getting younger, newer writers, um, which they kind of had to because Stan Lee's not writing everything now. So 1975, the average age of the writers on staff and the freelancers at Marvel, average age was 23. The average age of the artists, on the other hand, the average was 43. And that doesn't really mean there were a bunch of 43-year-old artists. It means they got a a bunch of young artists, too. People like, you know, Neil Adams and Jim Steranko, um, who were in their 20s, uh, maybe early to late 20s. But they still had a lot of people, even after Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko left, they had a lot of people like Jim Mooney and Gene Colan and Gil Kane, who had been working in comics since the Golden Age. So they're all like, you know, 50, 60 years old. So kind of a kind of a balance there. The position of editor-in-chief was very unstable after Stan Lee left for the next several years. So Stan Lee was editor-in-chief for over 30 years. And he had taken over from Joe Simon. Uh, But being editor-in-chief in in 1940 wasn't that hard. There were only like five books. So Stan Lee for uh, over 30 years. He's replaced by Roy Thomas, who lasts only a couple of years and and, and quits because he hates the job. Uh, He much prefers writing. So he's replaced by another person who was a writer, Lynn Wine, uh, who lasts less than a year, and he's replaced by another writer, Marv Wolfman, who lasts less than a year. Uh, and then he's replaced by another writer, Jerry Conway, who's like really young. He's just like, you know, um, in his early 20s. Uh, and as we'll see, the, some people have some problems with him. He doesn't last, he only lasts a few months. Then Archie Goodwin, who's an old hand, uh, but also a longtime writer. Uh, he comes on for a couple of years. Um And then finally, 1978, they get someone who lasts, also a former writer, Jim Shooter. Uh, He will usher Marvel into the, uh, through the end of the Bronze Age and into the beginning of the age to come. And 
under his guidance, there will be some really significant things accomplished. And there will also be some problems. All right, well, let's leave the superheroes for a while and go check out the underground comics scene that sort of rose to prominence at the same time as the quote-unquote Bronze Age of superhero comics was happening.